On today's show, we are joined by the king of SaaS himself, Jason Lipkin, and we are breaking down everything. We start with AI and how it's gonna change sales and marketing. We go through the biggest marketing mistakes founders and CEOs and CMOs make. And then we're gonna to talk to you all about brand marketing. When do you need to do it? When do you not need to do it? And how do you win at brand marketing at any stage of the game? Let's get into today's episode. Where I want to go first is, Jason, you've talked and tweeted a lot about the disruption that AI is going to cause, especially in support and especially in the SDR, BDR yes. function. And I'd love, Kieran and I have a lot of thoughts. We've, we've run a lot of tests there. I'd love to hear, where do you think we are today? And where do you think uh, this is actually going? And are we to, going to be to the point where BDR teams don't exist? Half as big? 10% of what they are now. What does well, that all look like? Here's the meta problem. Uh, there's two trends going on. Um, there's a larger trend outside of tech, in, in and outside of tech of efficiency. Everyone wants to get radically more efficient. HubSpot's radically more efficient than 24 months ago. Everyone across the board sure. went from like break even to 20% operating margins. And that's not, and that's ripping across everybody. So people are looking to AI for efficiency. At, at the micro level, we talk about sales, BDRs, and also marketing. One thing that may be controversial and is less discussed, but is true, is there aren't any people. There aren't any people. I can't find someone to run my HubSpot campaigns. I can't find someone to do the, yep. there are no, everyone wants to be a strategist and a boss. Um, I interviewed someone that you like, <laughs> I know. I interviewed someone this week. No, I'm yeah, laughing because I, I agree. This week. To help us at Saster with eight months of experience, came highly recommended. The top of her LinkedIn is strategist. I just want to work on, you've had eight months of experience. Strategist, strategist. <laughs> um, we, 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 I, I brought someone I thought I knew to help us on our little team with a few years of experience who said that he would actually run campaigns for us. But after four weeks, he never ran a campaign. He said, I'm, I'm done. I've got four years of experience. I'm not going to run campaigns myself. Okay. Um, and so <laughs> we just can't hire enough AEs, SDR. They're, they're, it's not that they're not applying to our LinkedIn's. You know, I put one job post up the other day. I got 700 auto uh, things, but you know, none of them are anybody that wants to do any work. So we're, we have to, like, we're, we're going to become a society in, in SaaS where we need robots because there's no one to do the marketing and sales work. So the fact that AI, as soon as AI is just good enough, to replace a BDR, an SDR, a marketing manager, a customer success rep, customers all across. It's going to happen. As soon as I can go to HubSpot and HubSpot's earlier, but as soon as I can turn on a switch that says marketing manager, and if I can't find anybody, I'm yep. going to turn that switch on, aren't I? And that, and, and I think we're almost there for SDRs and BDRs. And, it, and it's going to, and it's going to be like a two year journey. But as soon as I can turn that on in HubSpot, I'm just going to do it because I can't find anybody. I can't find anybody. Uh, yes, I, I, I'm seeing the same. Like, look, I know, Kieran, you've seen the same thing at Zapier because we've talked about it. But like, it is very hard to get people to want to do the work and who are focused on like grinding it out. And the best leaders are not strategists, by the way. Like the best leaders are deep S experts yeah. in the craft and are in deep the in the craft. Like right before we started recording, Kieran, you're sitting here telling us about all the custom GPTs you're building because like you're deep in the craft. You're not like just that's reading you books hire. and thinking about stuff. You want to hire a marketer work. that's doing custom yes. GPTs at night. You only want to hire hackers for a startup, especially. I don't care what they hack, whether it's marketing, sales yes. or, or product. But what happened was tech, you know, the since maybe, I don't know, 2018, something like that, tw tech went mainstream. When you guys joined HubSpot, it was yeah, still a weird thing to do, wasn't it? You were still, your parents probably thought you were weird. My parents thought I was making <laughs> terrible the idea. In my entire terrible life. <laughs> idea. Yeah. Now, like, it's what you do after school. Maybe I'll apply to Y Combinator. Maybe I'll go work right. at, at, at Zapier. Maybe I'll go work at HubSpot. Like, it's, it's utterly mainstream and it's good. But we needed to absorb so many humans that we lost the hackers, right? We went from like, I call them pirates and romantics, but I think you're right, they're hackers. And it used to be tech companies were like 50%, 80% hackers. Now they might be 5%, right? The problem with most companies is what happens is you have really great ICs. You have these really great people who can do work. And then you're like, oh, that person's great. I'll build a team around them. And then you lose that person and you get a bunch of okay people. And then that person's not a great manager anyway. And it's that kind of 
continuous thing that that a company does. But I'm actually okay if someone cut says, okay, well, I, I really want to move into strategy. If you've earned your stripes, what I've found recently is people want to move into strategy and yes. they haven't earned their stripes. So like, what am I, what are you going to go do? Like go build a pretty subpar strategy because you never did the work in the first place. Like the, the reason to get into these roles is to do the work. That's the, that's the most enjoyable part. The, I, I think people want to be a manager before they get to be a manager. And then all they're really doing is moving boxes around and playing with budget. Like to me, I think we, that I see that time and again that we've lost the the want to do the craft. Like we've lost the yeah. kind of want to do the work and we glorified the manager role. I do wonder if AI flattens the org structure because someone who is a really great person at doing the work can actually just get a bunch of AI agents to do much more work, right? Like, and so you actually need less managers because a lot of the work, the work that the manager is managing can be managed by an IC because it's not people, it's agents. And this kind of efficiency, like you talked about a, a, in, a, in your My First Million podcast, that the average SaaS company to get to 100 million needs to do three, 400,000 in, yeah. in revenue per employee. Like that is to me the way that tech companies can get, get there or even beyond that much more rapidly is like flatten the org structure, have these ICs who are much more capable of doing much more work because they have these AI tools to do it. It could be. It's so early though, you know. Before we get back to today's show, here's a quick word from HubSpot. If you're a marketer, one thing I know for sure is you love data and boy, do we have data for you. The 2024 State of Marketing Report is chock full of data and insights around the current trends that are shaping the market marketing industry today. Things like artificial intelligence, you know I love AI tools, personalization, influencer marketing, all of the topics that are key to getting a competitive advantage this year. It's going to make sure you're not stuck in old strategies and old tactics. So click that link in the description and go get your free copy of the 2024 State of Marketing Report today. Now let's get back to today's show. I was literally, I had a board meeting this morning Right. of an, a company that's very enterprise in the contact center where AI has been ripping through their side of the business. Okay, ripping through it. They're, I mean, for, like, the biggest force of nature, the massive change in accounts. And um, now they're seeing the results. They're seeing the results. Everyone has promised they can reduce their support agents by 50%. That's what every vendor promises. It's on Intercom's website. I don't know if it's on HubSpot's, mm -hmm. but everyone that may be a sub public that can ours. get away with promises, it has become a thing in the industry, 50% yeah. automation. And there's, it didn't work. And what's interesting, Kieran, and I'm not saying this will, won't change in a year. What's happening right now is they are bringing people back. They are bringing oh, human yeah. over. It's not human in the loop. It's human oversight. It's not that the hu one hallucination is the end of the world, but it's too important when the answer is wrong. So they're not getting AI back, yeah. but whether we'll need less management or ICs, maybe we need, maybe it's like engineering where every year engineers get better, right? And the managers have to get better and the ICs have to get better, but I don't know if we'll need less. We'll, we'll, we'll see. I don't know, but it's just very interesting that everyone's bringing humans back to supervise this enterprise AI. <laughs> well, I think part of it, Jason, is that we, you, you, we were talking earlier and you were like, we've made this huge yeah. move to efficiency and everybody's cared about efficiency and expanding operating margin and all of those things. There is a limit to efficiency, right? And it turns out that that, that, that support AI that's yes. not doing a good enough job, that's having a real drag on your attention. And your attention is how you grow. And so you're like, well, actually, like, I care way more about growth than efficiency. Yes, I care about efficiency, but I still have to grow. And if I have to throw people at the problem to grow, I'm going to throw people at the problem to grow. And I think that's my hypothesis of what's going on. But let's, let's, let's say that AI does get good enough and it does solve some of these problems. Where's the money going to go? Because you still have to grow at the yes. end of the day. Like, are marketing budgets going to get a lot higher? Are IT budgets going to get a lot higher? Like, where's the money going to go if you do need 50% less support reps? Well, it is interesting. I, I think, first of all, the money is just always flowed to higher value things. Um, for the entire time that the three of us have been in software, sales led motions and even hybrid motions have spent about 40% of their 40 to 40% of the revenue on sales. It hasn't changed. I don't know what HubSpot is today, but even with all of its brand and word of mouth, it's probably close to that. It's probably close to 40, 45%. That's the average. So all the tools, the hundreds of tools yeah. we've bought and the sales automation and, and all, and RevOps and, and all of this, we're still spending 40 to 45%. So I, a meta question is where, will any of this make us more efficient on its own? 
yeah. on its own or will we just absorb will we just spend as much as we can and just spend in different places and add more value like if nothing else like software is better than when we started in software way better way better way better way better, way better. All, like early versions of hubspot early versions of like e-signature for me echo sign docusign adobe sign like it looks similar superficially but like 100 times better right so I don't know if support's even gotten 1% better since we've been in software, but may, maybe AI will let that finally happen. Maybe maybe it will get better, but it, it's a, we find a way, it finds a way to spend that money. So I don't know, maybe the sufficient thing strings this, listen, in the old days, let's step back in the old days, the old Adobe's, the old Intuit's, the, when we sold software on DVD ROMs and CD ROMs, and even to some extent today, we had we had 50% net margins on those products. 50% net margins. Net. That's the way software used to be. Microsoft. We would, you know, you bring in a million dollars and five hundred thousand dollars goes in the bank. You know, th these companies never needed venture capital or anything because it wasn't easy, but we don't have any SaaS companies that are that today. I don't even think Zoom Info, Zoom Info is probably the closest, but they're not there, right? So really the question is how efficient will the markets force us to be? And I think we don't have discipline. It's like the, the, the snacks in the cabinet downstairs in the kitchen. If you're working from home in the kitchen, like, <laughs> we'll, eat, we'll eat as many as we can get away with. <laughs> so if, if, some, if, if next, next year, and I, listen, I love HubSpot to death. If the Wall Street says next year, hey, HubSpot, you can go, you can go back to 0% break even, right? 0% margins and spend it, spend it on marketing and we'll give the money to Kip, right? It'll just, it, we'll just do what we're allowed to do. <laughs> you're, you're not wrong that the, like the constraints yeah. matter and that constraints have changed things. Do you think marketers are going to get more yes. power? The three of us have, have a, have a, a bit of a breadth of experience and, um, and HubSpot blends into the small of SMB sometimes. But when we're in B2B, we yeah. forget what our sisters and brothers in B2C do in consumer. In consumer, the marketers rule and the sales is a distant yeah. second if it exists. Okay. Because marketers are sales. If you drive conversions to the website and they buy that nice flower sweater or that cool black sweater from the website, that is marketing is sales. They have huge budgets and they deploy it. I think that that. If, if I can go in, into, for example, HubSpot and turn on my automatic SDR and my automatic marketer and automatic, that is empowering the marketer. And I think at a minimum, I hope that marketing takes over more and more of the SDR, BDR function through automation. Me too. And I hope it goes, maybe the marketers even take over some level of like small business sales, right? Where it's more transactional. Maybe sales doesn't need to do any, and it becomes high value, bigger deals only. And that should, I, I think if AI does nothing else, it should at least incrementally increase the value of marketers. They, they can own more, just like in consumer, right. they own more. We see, we see a lot of that. We do see some of that in product led growth. Like I think our product led companies, like because they have touchless or they start a touchless and they move up in, into sales and the marketer is usually there before the sales team. And a lot of the demand is coming from the interactions within the product and the marketers kind of own that, you know, it's kind of a split between marketer and growth. And I do think that that, that will be continued with AI because it, AI is able to just automate a lot of that for even large companies. But there was a tool that I sent to Kip. It's the tool that actually allows you to speak with the AI and the AI can actually provide you of, of a demo with a product, right? Oh, Hume, so H-U-M-E. Yeah. And so the thing that's fascinating about that, because one of the early companies in AI that I was really fascinated by was with Adept, right? Because Adept was, you know, for someone who works in software, Adept is this company, um, I think it was eight people, maybe from OpenAI or one of the large AI companies who started that company. And they were going to put an AI skin on top of software. And so you could actually control software through natural language, uh, whether it's your Excel, Salesforce, or whatever it may be. And to me, who works in software, I'm like, boy, that changes everything about the industry that I work in, because why do you care about the product that you use if you never have mm. to use that interface, right? But this AI tool allows you to say, hey, like, you know, if you're on the if you're on the call and Kip's a sales rep for HubSpot, hey, show me this or show me that or show me this. And that person, that that tool can speak to you like a human, but actually can re in real time show you the product as you're asking the questions. And in that, in that case, that marketer can own much more of the customer experience. Like one of the things that really happens to companies as they scale is they ship their design org or, or they ship their they ship their org, right? Org structure. And it just becomes such a disjointed, awful experience. I think broadband companies are one of the best examples of this. And I think if you have a marketer who can own much more of that customer journey, it's actually much better for, for the user yeah. as well. And so I, I'm curious if you, have you seen any 
Have you seen this? You're, you're an investor in a lot of different companies. Have you seen this done well anywhere through AI? Or have you seen any of these AI sales tools start to like shift a company in that direction? Well, first of all, let me answer, let me step back for a minute. I think that's, those are good observations, but that's pretty inside baseball for very sophisticated companies like like Zapier, okay? HubSpot's got 205,000 customers. I don't think most of them can have a growth department. <laughs> we need a toggle, yeah, 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 okay? Yeah. I'm not even yeah, sure yeah. most, uh, <laughs> like why, I mean, even yeah. very few, like we talk about growth, but the best folks, like the split between marketing and growth is the PLG, it is a little B2C-ish, but those are rare birds, yeah, like that they can run SQL queries and, do, right. and do, do these incredible multivariant complex analyses and campaigns. I mean, like, I know we live in the world, but it's elite. The world, the regular world can't have a growth department and a marketing department. They can have an app. <laughs> they, they can have an app. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Amazing. And, um, so that's where I see the real disruption. There's a startup. I'll tell you at, at a different, an adjacent example. There's a startup I'm on the board of called owner.com. Yeah. Adam's, Adam's awesome. awesome. I love that and guy. What the ch company's changed a lot since I invested. They just crossed 20 something million in revenue, growing double digits and. What rest, what I didn't even know how the restaurants work before. I thought they were restaurants. Restaurants are high churn, no time. It's the smallest of the SMBs. They don't, they don't sit in front of a computer. They, they, you can barely text them. Okay. Uh, their businesses are low margin and really tough. Okay. And they're selling a super high growth marketing product, a marketing product in essence so that, and you need to do everything for them. They do marketing automation for restaurants, everything. You need to automate the emails. You need to automate the outreach. You need to automate the SEO. You need to automate the website, like everything. It's not even one click. It has to just be magic. And so that's where AI should take us. Forget about the nerds like us, right? That love right. marketing. The 200,000, you know, four, it'll be 300,000 HubSpot customers or whatever, the 10 million restaurants, 50 million for for an owner or someone, it needs to be mad, like, and I, and it's working. You know, you, you've seen it, Kip. It, it, it is working. Right. It's early and all that you want. Yeah. So I, uh, the related point is I think we, we, we talk about AI, but really for the, and we should be talking about automation. What can you truly automate? Right. Yes. And Zapier is so early to automation. It's also, you know, we'd run out of time. It's really interesting to watch an automation leader, uh, become an AI leader. Um, but if you can, that's what we all need. We need automation because we don't have people. We need automation. So, that's the one I've seen in my right. portfolio. The one I'm personally, when I got really, it took me a while to get excited. The one I got excited about is because there's no people is this company called Opus Clip. Okay. And I'll tell you why. Okay. You guys know Opus. Uh, yeah. We use yeah. Opus Clip. And, yeah. Um, we love Opus Clip. So for like two years, everyone was telling me to make clips. Harry Stebbings was telling me to make clips. All these people, I'm like, <laughs> so finally I found this Saster super fan to make us clips. It took them a month and they gave us two. And I put them up on TikTok or something. And actually the first one on TikTok is the best TikTok I've ever had, okay? It was great. It took them a month. And then we said, well, we'll pay you. Can you get us any other? And two months later, they said they're too busy. Okay, so I got two clips in three months. And yeah, it was better than anything. And then, and then on Opus, I'm like, oh, you know, now we do two a day. So that's 60 a month. So I can do 60 a month instead of two in 60 days that is unreliable that needs a vacation, that, that the person quits. That's, for me, that's where AI changed my marketing, right? Because I could do something that I wanted to do that was cheap that I could not do before. That's the magic. Cheap, wanted to do it, couldn't do it before, right? And, you know, I mean, HubSpot did it for marketing automation. Zapier did it for making these these app to app connections, which were just too hard to do before, right? I'm not saying there weren't other vendors, but these are two companies that made it magical, yeah. right? That's what we want from really want from AI for SMBs, or uh, we just want this magic, this one click automation that of stuff we couldn't do before AI, right? VCs talk, but that's what we really want. So the, the Opus and the owners are are my learnings, and I I think with so many smart people working on it, I'm just I'm just you know. I think in 24 months, all of our products are going to be better, better, just better, better. right? Better. I, I, I could, could not agree more. Okay. So we've talked yeah. a little automation AI. That's, that, that's important, but we're marketers. Kieran and I are marketers. We got you, you, you are a marketer, go to market expert. My favorite tweet that you've ever done is, is and I quote yeah. it to everybody all the time. They always laugh is a CMO's first job is to understand that the CEO is actually yes. the CMO. And that the founder or the CEO, they run marketing. And if we believe that, which I, I do personally, I'd love to, like, what, what have you, what mistakes have you seen that 
founders make on the marketing side? Like you have invested in tons of successful companies. What are the great wins and the great losses of founders? Yeah, and it's funny. I stole that from Maria Progolino, uh, who was at our speaker dinner at our first Ask oh, yeah. Europa, I would say 2018, 2017. She was sitting next to me at dinner and she'd been like, this was like her fourth CMO. I think she was CMO at Anaplan. And I think the CMO of Anaplan actually was a marketer by training. Like had not all, most CEOs aren't literally CMOs by training, which is why people get confused by your question, right? Um, but yeah. you can't be a successful founder without being a great marketer. One way or the other, one, even if it's a quirky, weird way, like way to, uh, is it Zapier? You're still a good, great marketer at some level. And so she said, I've only, the reason I've survived more than 12 months in these roles is because I know that I think it was, what is his name of the ad plan? Frank Caldeone or something. Do I have that wrong? He's, he's the marketer. We talk. Right. And then when, the, when the mission's been set, I go execute even it. And, um, and I carried that with, <laughs> and then I've watched this again and again. And I'll tell you, I'll, t- I'll answer your question what the founders make, but I think it's an even bigger issue that the executives make. The executives make. And too many CMOs oh, let's and do it. CROs, you know, they used to be VPs of marketing and now VP of sales. Now they're the same people with title inflation, but they'll come into these roles <laughs> and they'll be like, <laughs> I love and, that. and the C- and what, and what worked? What worked at, at, at owner? What worked at owner was like rogue marketing, this and that, to, and then hand to mouth text marketing in person. And then someone comes out. Well, I was at HubSpot. I was a director of marketing at HubSpot and this is how we did it. And, and they're too rigid, right? And, and they're, they just, I hate and that. Great that so it worked. Much. HubSpot is one of the 10 best SaaS companies of all time. But what are the odds that that playbook is going to work at the next company intact? Zero, right? Zero. And I wrote that tweet and I, and well, I say it again and again. And so many people get mad, especially on LinkedIn. And they're like, well, wh- that's not what I'm hired for. As CMO, I'm hired for my expertise and my 70 years of domain expertise. No, you're no. hired to do what's working. Um, do it 2000 hours a week because the CEO doesn't have time. Make it be- incrementally improve it and then add layers, add layers that we're not doing because you, you, know, you can't do everything when w- at that level. You got to add stuff, add events, add social, add the podcast, but. It's just death for an executive when they ignore what's working. This is, what they, I know this sounds silly, but I see 80% of the CROs and CMOs fail come into a startup, coming out of a great place, a HubSpot, a Zapier, whatever, and they bring, and they want to run their playbook. They don't listen. They don't listen to what's mm. worked. They don't listen. And Kieran and I have, have argued, have, have talked about this so many times because it's like, if you bring your own playbook, you're also not intellectually honest and curious. You're not intellectually curious. And you're not intellectually I, curious. I, I would actually argue that a CMO's job is the same as a CEO, serve the customer and deeply understand your customer. You know who understands the customer the best? The CEO and the founder of the business. Cause like they've had that singular view. And if you don't listen to them and you don't build a new playbook for those customers, you are going to fail. It's also playbooks are not successful because of the tactics only. There's so much nuance why what worked for HubSpot worked for HubSpot, right? There's time in, there's like luck, there's a bunch of different things that would work to make a marketing strategy successful and trying to replicate that five years later for a different company, just ad, ad hoc, like not even trying to think about what's yes. different for that customer or different for that market. I don't think it, I don't see, I don't think it really, it rarely, rarely ever works. works. I, I don't think it, I think it rarely ever works. Like every company, even though it's B2B and every company kind of looks similar, their marketing looks similar, there is a ton of like nuance to that company and that customer and, and what works. Like a Zapier customer and how they adopt Zapier is actually very different from a HubSpot customer and how they adopt HubSpot and how they research products. And just companies have different DNA. Yeah, just very different. But to answer that, so that's the, my advice to the, to the, to the revenue and the marketing and revenue leaders. Like, don't like listen and figure out what works and do that better. Then add your brilliant ideas. Okay. Once you've improved the engine, the flip side, you ask what mistakes founders make. And, and I get it. Most first time founders have never hired a marketing leader or a sales leader. They have no idea. They think marketing, they think marketing is a waste of money and sales is a black box. That's what most founders think. Okay. <laughs> and they're wrong. And we can talk about that. And. And beca- but because they don't actually understand marketing at all, and they, they sort of understand founder-led sales, but only a piece of it, here's what they don't do. They don't know how to let the marketer especially do what they're good at and backfill their weaknesses, okay? So, like, mm. I- I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up this uh, Saster blog post of HubSpot at a billion, okay? HubSpot used to publish in order where where it got its customers from, okay? And I'm just going to read it. Word of mouth, 33%. Mm-hmm. Google, 26%. 
HubSpot blog, 13, review sites, three, social media, 3%. Okay. So if I brought in a head of marketing and all he wanted to do was work on social media, I would fire them because it's only 3%. Okay. But if I brought in somebody that was good at the blog, whatever blog meant there, but wasn't great at word of mouth. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then that's who you have. Play with the soldier, you know, the the folks you have on the team, the, the soldiers you have on the field. And so I see founders get frustrated because a marketer, marketing or sales leader won't do exactly what they know should be done, but you have to figure out what they're good at, what they're good at. So if, if, if it's at the bottom, but you know, and, and, or, you know, if, if you like events and your marketers never done events, they're not going to be any good at it. You're not going to get any leads. If you hate events, but your marketer knows they work. Okay. I, I was the first investor in a company called Revenue Cat, which is an API for managing subscription management. It's now the number one embedded piece of software for subscriptions on all of mobile. Okay. It's on 33% of all mobile devices. They hired their wow. first senior marketer and they had never done an event in their life. Now they have a mascot. <laughs> the CEO, and he's great. The marketer is great. The CEO is <laughs> making fun of their mascot on social media last week. But why did they do that? Well, actually he came out of a developer focused environment, but he knew how to build community through events. So they're doing what I call a horizontal right. event strategy. They're actually not just focused on WWC. They want to just be everywhere. So that you get this warm brand connection with, with this company. Now it works, you know, they're at tens of millions in revenue and more importantly, developers know them, right? But like, yeah, the CEO, Jacob, he might not love that idea of investing the time in events, but the marketer's great at it and it works, right? So that's the kind of thing founders, like Jacob's a good, so he thought about it. Hey, I'm an engineer. I don't really believe in this, but my guy's great at it, right? You got to support them rather than, un- and it, accidentally undermine them when you think these things are stupid, when you think social is stupid, when you think, but if they, if it works, if they have a track record of being really good at it, then back them, right? There's many ways to get leads, aren't there? There's tons. There, there are tons of and ways And asking to a get marketer leads. to do something and, they and don't know, death, right? Well, that's, that's, that's the theme of the last few minutes of conversation here is that there's magic in the depth of knowledge. If somebody's really good at something, they will find a way to make it work. Even if it might not be the perfect fit yeah. for that situation, they'll still get some value out of it. Maybe there's something better that could be done, but they'll still get the value and like live to fight another day, like grind it out and make it yeah, work. Yeah, but right? find the strength in your hires. If they're good, if they're not good, yeah. let them go. Like there's the, there's, you know, don't focus on relative strengths. Well, Jason's pretty bad at everything in marketing, but he's the least bad at podcasting that you got to let Jason go, but just figure out what he's good at <laughs> and let him do like, let them do like 40% of their time in marketing on whatever acquisition channel that they're the best at. Just let them do it. Even if it's, as long as it's one of your top three or four, right? As long as it's top three or four, you got to keep in motion, right? You got to keep the top of funnel going. You got to keep the engine going. Yeah, yeah. The best people will figure it out, but he, I'll tell you the, the last one, you know, the, another example on the revenue side is it's really a flag when a company that is mainly outbound driven hires ahead of sales. that's only done inbound. They die. They mm. die. Okay. Now, they do. if you have a, a, a hybrid model of inbound and outbound, are you doing a little outbound? Will the great head of sales over six months, nine months, 12 months, add up that function, figure out. Absolutely. I've seen it time and time again, but I've seen a hundred percent of zeros fail when they're all in inbound. They come into an outbound thing. They panic. They hire some random director of outbound that doesn't know the product. <laughs> he doesn't know how to do outbound. And all of a sudden they're sending 10,000 emails to Kip and Kieran thinking that this, uh, this cadence will <laughs> magically get them to buy the product. They don't know how to do this, this playbook. <laughs> so you got to back, you got, you know, don't make sure as founders, there's not a total mismatch for skills for what you need. It's not the executive's fault. Here's the last thing I'll say. When you make a bad hire, it's always your fault as the founder or the hiring manager. It's never the hiree's fault. Never. And it took me, I didn't, I don't, I don't think I figured this out till like a year ago. (laughs) 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 I mean, I knew it, but I didn't know it for sure that every, sometimes I would blame the hire for being lazy or not doing the job or they would make me sad. Or especially if it was a round trip hire, someone that came back that let me down. Like that really hurts when a round trip lets you down, right? But then I realized it's my fault. I didn't spend the time to know if it was the right role for them, right? The hire can never spend enough. You can never do enough interviews to really know what you're getting yourself into. It's impossible. You can't spend a hundred hours at the company, right? You need to work for a company for two months to actually know if it's the right role for you. (laughs) Yeah. You have to match the person to the 
go to market fit, you have to match the person to the, you know, what, what stage they are in their life and what the role takes. The other thing, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Jason, but the other thing I, one of the tweets you sent, which um, was around this topic, I thought was really interesting is you kind of, you know, within like within three months, if that person's not successful, they're never going to be successful. I think you said that maybe yeah. about a sales leader, maybe it wasn't that many lengths, but it was a certain amount of period. It was a certain period of time. And it was like, I've never seen anyone really turn it around within that period of time. Could you, could you, am I right in saying that? And could you maybe speak to that a little bit? Cause I'm curious if that, if that's what you yeah. feel like for sales, how do we feel? What is that time frame? And do we feel the same as true for head of marketing or not? I do think for every functional area, and people challenge me, but then when you slow down and think about it, you guys are, will agree, everyone, will, everyone agrees when they think about it. You have to put points on the board in one sales cycle. You have to put points in the sale. And sales mm -hmm. is the simplest mm -hmm. one to understand. You come in, let's say I, I come into a startup. I, I come in, it's not easy, but I got a hundred leads. Okay, I got a hundred leads. I wish I had a thousand, I wish it, but I got a hundred. And right now, each month out of a hundred leads, we're closing $10,000 in new bookings. I'm just keeping it simple. If you're good at sales, you should at least turn those 100 leads into 12,000 instead of 10,000. It doesn't matter if times are good. It doesn't matter if there's a downturn. Like let's say we used to turn 100 leads into 100,000 and now we're turning 100 leads into 10,000 because times are tough. Still a great sales leader will always turn it into at least 12 or 13,000. Now, sometimes the 10,000 will double or triple, but th there's a basic playbook. Move out the folks that can't close, improve the outbound, improve the communication, Get smarter with the customers. Understand the competition better, right? Get more involved with deals. Go visit your customers, even tiny deals. I mean, Adam from Owner, tiny small businesses, he's out there all the time visiting customers in person. It always works. And so I've never seen, and so a lot of sales folks are like, no, I need like six months or nine months or 12 months. No, you may need 12 months to prove to the whole world that you can change the course of humanity in, in, in startups. But if you can't make a difference in one, <laughs> in one thing, and it's true of marketing too, do something your first week. Do, do a webinar. Do yes, better, right. do better, uh, start drip marketing that's not being done. Do better qualification. I'm not saying you can double or triple or quadruple opportunities in a sales cycle, but you sure can improve the ones. You can get more SQLs. You can make a chart change first if you're a marketer week, first week in a week. Put some stuff in place that always works. And I'm only looking for a 20% improvement for any of those things. 20 in customer retent in NPS. And you can do it in customer success. In one quarter, you can make your customers 20% happier. You know how? Go, no one visits customers center. Go visit them. Go ask them their, pro don't hide from the problems. <laughs> don't hide from the QBR. Like don't, don't show up and say, isn't everything great when you know it's not? Right. We had a call not too long ago. There's a vendor where we're one of their top three customers and um, I appreciate them, but I don't love them because it, there's endless problems. It goes down. The integrations don't work. So be it like the, nothing's perfect. Right. But we showed up to the to the to the to this QBR meeting and the, they had the CS person asked, uh, everything seems great. Like, do you have any feedback for me? And I, I don't usually join, but I do this. One. I'm like, OK, be honest. Do you really want my feedback? <laughs> <laughs> because in 2018, you went down during the middle of Saster Annual. This happened in 2019. You sure you want my feedback in 2024? And the CS leader said, yes, I absolutely want your feedback. And I gave it calmly, but uh, but she left the Zoom. Oh, oh wow. whoa. Okay. So, no, we can laugh, but this is, but like, rough. imagine you come in and you're head of CS. You that's can do rough. better than that, right? I mean, I'm, and so, so yeah, that's why more. I know people want more time. Um, and the real truth is, so quantitatively, you should see it in, w in one sales cycle. You know, uh, qualitatively, you'll see it in a couple of weeks. Now you see why it's in a, just a couple of weeks, right? Can I just add one quick point on this? I, cause I just want to reiterate that, that is, uh, I just want to reiterate that is really great advice for anyone listening to this who who is going to become a marketing leader. I think the number one reason a lot of marketing folks fail in their first leadership roles, and I've seen it because I try to give this advice to people who are taking on the new leadership roles, is they pack all the grandioso plans in the first like six to eight months, which is a change the website, change things around on the team structure, change all these things that never change any of the metrics, right? It's all the kind of, and it's, and you know where it comes from? It comes from the CEO having all this stuff that they want to see happen, and that's the reason maybe they the last CMO has had left because they never really got those things right. And they, they kind of want the marketer to do those things. But I would actually try to spend the first three months just rolling your sleeves up and doing the small things. Like, like when you actually look at the things to be done, try to package them into like long-term huge upside, but like way out there. And then like short-term can make some small inroads to show I know yeah. what I'm doing, like to show that I actually can do this job. And I would try as a marketing leader to like 
spend most of my time in the first three months on the, hey, I need to show the CEO. Yeah, but maybe the first three days. I actually can do this job. Yeah, you're actually more. I, I've always I thought three months. I I've think already lost I sh- you as a founder. I if I myself. need three months for the the okay. biggest advice yeah, is, is and I, you know in the old urgency. days I used to do this with my engineers and it drove they didn't get it at first when we would hire new engineers I would say first week ship a feature and I would say pick right. one that's like a headache for the rest of the team especially the non engineering team and just give me something I've been waiting two years for that's like easy. Like, and it was often something on the admin console, okay, that I've been like a sort that just never worked or a feature. Like, I've been waiting two years to be able to look up Kip's thing in the admin console. And I used to do it. And then they would come in and the engineer would be a hero. Be like, okay, this was so easy. This took two hours. I know, but I've been waiting two years. Right. And so you can do this in marketing too. Come in and like, what? just figure yeah. out what like the niggles are. Like if the CEOs wanted to do right or wrong, if, if she or he has wanted to do a podcast for two years and it's too hard and, and you know the team because you did it, just sp- spool it up the first week. Do, do yeah. something, not, not yeah, yeah. that survey. Really I mean, a, a way, a long time ago, we have like 200 and something sponsors to pull off Saster, you know, and, 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 and making them happy is really hard. Marketers are grouchy. I don't know if you guys knew this. Yeah, and so I, like, <laughs> we hired this guy for head of customer success about a month before Saster mm-hmm. Annual one year, and he was everyone. You know, everyone gave him eleven stars, and we hired him out four months before Saster Annual, and then three weeks, and then two weeks, and one week, and finally I sat down. I'm like, what's what have you learned talking to these sponsors? He's like, oh, I haven't talked to anybody yet. I'm just kind of getting the lay of the land. <laughs> so like, that's why three months for him. <laughs> I think he probably still is, hates me. I don't know. But like, you don't have three months, right? Especially if it's like something like yeah, uh, yeah. inbounds coming up in 30 days, you definitely don't have th- yeah. <laughs> three months, but you can see the disconnect yeah. from his, from that three months from like the clock ticking down, right? I don't care. We got 31 days, 20, you know, and I'm kind of trying to be hands off. Like it's cool. Like not, you've talked to nobody. You, you didn't send an email. So, um, I feel that way about mark new marketers and it's their first month check-in and they haven't talked to a customer. And you're like, oh boy, this yeah, is yeah. Especially empower <laughs> your market. They haven't this learned is, one. I think problem. every executive, and an executive, you know, it's it's a lowercase e. It doesn't mean a VP. You want them talking to customers their first week too, right? I think yes, I can criti- I, I'm ultra critical of a VP of product that never does it. I give an F minus to a VP of sales. Someone on the marketing team below the VP or CMO level, you might need to empower them. They might not know that they're allowed to talk to a customer. You might need to help your team, right? right? Because they've never gotten that opportunity their first week, right? You might have to help give them a boost so right. they know they can do it. But then give them that opportunity. If they don't take it, I wouldn't want them on my team. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, even even if you've got some call recordings, yeah, the other things, the call right? even if it's yeah. not a live yeah. call, the there's, yeah. there's a way to yeah. do it. And, and, and see really if they actually listen. Agree. They don't always actually listen to them. Yeah. <laughs> that that is very very true. All right, well, I want to I want to yeah. talk about brand because I know there's a bunch of founders who are going to listen to today's show, and the number one question I get from founders yeah. when I'm talking with them is, "How do I build a brand? When do I think about investing in brand?" And you you had a tweet which actually you and I were going back on, which is why why we're doing the show today, and it was like, "Oh." You know, a million dollars, no brand, $10 million, like, I think it was like, start to think about it. A hundred million dollars, like you're doing it. Once you're at a billion dollars, it's like most of what you're doing was like, is the rough summary. But like, what do you really, what do you really think? And what do you tell people? I think it, um, it all ties back to a learning. I, an old canonical Saster post I wrote was about mini brand. And a mini brand is when, you know, Kip and Kieran and Jason off the street haven't heard of you, but in your little industry, right? In, in, in this niche, I mean, maybe, maybe you guys have heard of if it's a certain type of AI marketing tool that you're passionate about. In your, everyone starts to hear about you. Okay. Mm-hmm. We, all three of us had heard of Opus. Okay. Opus in the grand scheme yeah. of things doesn't have a brand. Okay. There's a lot, there's a million video tools out there, but it has a mini brand. It has a mini brand. And so as soon as, a double digit percent of your core customer, your core ICB has heard of you. You need to do brand marketing. As soon as 10%, 5% of your, not of the whole world, not of the whole world of marketing automation or integrations, but of your core buyer, when they've heard of you, you got to flip it around. You have a mini brand. Like it's not Coke or Pepsi or Apple, but if you invest in that brand, that brand equals word of mouth. And on that old HubSpot slide, it didn't say brand marketing was number one, but you know what number one was word of mouth. Right. And, and, and the meta topic is how do you invest in word of mouth? Right. And it'd be nice if your products were hundred percent viral and it would be nice if everyone blogged about you, but brand is 
Brand is both a, you know, it, 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 it's a word that, that can, can seem, can frustrate founders because it can seem like a money pit, but that's how you inv- keep that going. You keep word of mouth going through your brand. And, you know, we, and, and I, and the, I remember one of my learnings as a founder in the early days, I went to a, a startup date into it. And one of the founders, I can't remember who the founder, maybe it was Scott Cook or one of the other guys got up and he said, let me tell you what I've learned about marketing. <laughs> The first year of Intuit, we got 80% of our customers through word of mouth. Last year at Intuit, we got 80% of our customers through word of mouth. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I had an aha in marketing. I'm like, okay, okay. Um, and so brand seem, and, and, and now, and the other thing, so that was, and then the other thing we've learned is we've been doing SaaS a long time. Okay. And if we want to talk about SaaS in particular, and in the old days, we thought it was risky. We didn't, we didn't understand what, 100% NRR meant we didn't understand what these things meant. Now we look at companies. Now we've got so many of the folks we know are past a billion in revenue. HubSpot's past two billion in revenue, right? And now it's clear to us that 80% of buyers buy who they've heard of. We don't have time. Like there are, there are the nerds, the folks that play with tools. And that's how you get off the ground as a startup. But as you scale, I can't, I can't try out 40 HubSpot competitors. Maybe I'll try one <laughs> HubSpot and one more. And yeah. actually, if I like HubSpot, I might not even finish trying the other one. I got like 30 seconds for the HubSpot better. If it's not like 10 times better, I'm going to I'm going to stick with HubSpot. So maybe that's a long answer. Like I know a brand seems an anathema and don't invest in brand if you don't have one. But be cognizant if you have a mini brand. Be cognizant if you go to an event and multiple people have heard about you. Be cognizant if your partners start talking about you. Right. Be cognizant if people on the parts of social media that actually matter are talking about you triple down. Right. Don't run TV commercials. That's a little expensive until you get bigger, but triple down on brand and just come up with your best ideas within a budget. And and, you know, and and the learning is you if you trust your head of marketing, if you trust them, then you come up with a pie chart. How much of our money and time are we going to put into marketing? Right. And and trust them that if it's 30 percent of the budget and 30 percent of the time, let them do, let them do what they, they think is best, right or wrong. Well, I mean, as a head of marketing, I love that. <laughs> but no, no, I mean, the, the old adage in the early days of HubSpot, Kieran and I would always say is like, Oh, we, we want to win the week of all the people out there who might consider this thing yeah. that we are selling. Like we want to be the thing they talk about that week. And I, and I think what, what people get stuck on with brand marketing is like, Oh, I got to do billboards or podcast ads or commercials. And it's like, you don't actually have to do all those things. You have to say, what is a different, clever idea that I can afford to do that's going to get everybody's attention? And and by everybody, just like you said, in your ICP, the people who would buy and consider your product, how can you get their attention that week? And then you start stacking that up over weeks and months, and you've built a real, not just mini brand, but a capital B brand. And that's like where the magic Yeah, a lot of the stuff, that is a great insight a lot of this stuff brand, whether it's brand or other or for me uh, it's it, my, the one i always talk about is, is a weekly webinar you got to do it every week that's the thing that yeah. founders and new executives don't do they de- you got to experiment that's part of mar- if you experiment and nowhere else it's marketing you got to experiment all the time and you have to maybe even put 10 percent of at least 10, the best marketers always put at least 10 percent of their budget into experiments right you have to right but um anything that works remotely you got to do it every week and I, you know, a thing I say to, I've said to founders for 10 years that always works, we do one ourselves is the one thing that always works is a weekly webinar, build a list and invite all your prospects and your customers to a weekly webinar. It always works. And, um, and they, they're like the first week, well, only two people came. I'm like, well, were they prospects? Yeah. Would they, you know, okay, well, you got a point, you got points on the board and then they don't, they got busy the next <laughs> week and then they did it next month. It doesn't work. But if you do 52 weeks of, I've been doing a, a Wednesday 10 a.m. webinar since 2006. It all, it nice. worked, it worked yesterday and it worked in 2006. And, um, but, uh, uh, I mean, I did take one break when I wasn't working, but, um, that, that so many things in marketing don't work because we don't do them every, it's not, people say consistency, right? But that's, that's kind of a, a lame social media. It, the answer, it's, it's every week. Yeah, they don't they don't want to grind and they and they get they get um distracted by shiny things. Kip and I have talked about this forever, which is if the born thing works, yes. do the born thing and get over yourself, right? Like I think people want to get distracted by something new, 
but it tends to be like a couple of things works really well and you just have to repeat you and do but that. but kip's it's point totally i agree no with that but here's anymore. the thing everyone thinks they're working hard today everyone that's working two jobs in a side hustle right. and working 15 hours a week thinks from home is overworked okay so you can't <laughs> be subjective it's they think they're grinding it out okay answering five inbound emails a week and doing six customer calls if you force people to do it every week for kip's point it will get that's the kpi one a one way to do it it's got to be every week not i forgot or i got busy yeah. every one and that's why i like i like wednesday i tell everyone to do it wednesday at 10 a.m but it really doesn't matter when you do it but it's the middle of the week it's a specific time and you and for, 52 weeks a year folks if you do anything 52 weeks a year uh, at the same time, it will get better or they'll quit. <laughs> literally, your reps. literally everything outside of like meta yeah. and Google ads compounds in marketing. Like if right. you do almost yes. anything in marketing and you do it every day or every week, it compounds. And a year later, you're yeah. like, holy hell, the results are dramatically different. Than yeah, the other thing, you know, ago. I keep I, I keep founders forget it. You guys know this so well, but founders forget it is. You're lucky if 10% of your prospects are in market at any given time. You're lucky. Yes. You're lucky. And it may even be lower right now, right? It may even be lower right now because there's dislocations in the market and HubSpot has such a great suite. I can just buy more from HubSpot. Like it's actually, and so like you think it's so frustrating. Why not only are sales cycles seem long when you start, but like why, why won't, why won't Karen buy? Right. But he might buy next year or the year after. These are long. There's a lot going on on Kip's plate. And Kip's got like a hundred things at HubSpot that he wants to fix, but he can't address them all this quarter. Right. So you, that's why no. doing this stuff compounds because we think founders naively think so many more customers are in market than they are. But you got to market to them. That doesn't mean they're not interested. It doesn't mean that Kip won't open your email. It doesn't mean he won't read your content about how to create great clips or create automate SDRs. He's going to read it. He cares about it. He's passionate about it. It's just this week is not the right time to buy. He has budget. He even has budget if, he, if, if he's got a budget. But and so if you don't do it every week, you're going to think it doesn't work when actually it's working. You don't realize it's working. Yeah. And because of that, at that moment when I am in market, that, e yeah. that email, that webinar, Yes. I'm going to act and I'm going to respond and I'm going to be more likely to do because I've built, you built yeah. trust with me, right? Because I've, uh, you've been with me all along the way, not just so do when your, it was I like your, I'm going to, I'm going to write up your advice. Do it every week. This is the cheat code. There's no excuses. Yeah. Yeah. There's no subjective. <laughs> Pick five, at least five or six things to do in marketing that you do every week. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> grinding it out. I, the first year I worked at HubSpot, I wrote three blog articles See? every day for a year. And it's you know what? The Turns out that was a smart and wise thing to do. Uh, we, I got one question before we go. We haven't talked about product marketing at all. Every founder I talk to, especially technical founders, they love product marketing. They think product marketing is the end all and be all <laughs> of marketing. And like my first yeah, hire is product marketing. Mm -hmm. And I think product marketing is like medium important. Um, and so I want to get your take. Where does product marketing sit and how should people prioritize product marketing? How does the customer know about the product marketing? That's the problem. Exactly. You don't, here's my tip to founders. You don't need product marketing until you're big enough that you don't need to know about it. Because when you need product <laughs> marketing, Kip or Kieran will figure it out for you. So I literally mean 95% yep, right. of founders don't need to know what product marketing is and are wasting precious energy building assets that no one will ever see and no one will ever read that are too sophisticated and are wrong. Figure out who your target buyer is, figure out a, a simple message that you would buy from. Write an email that is so good, you would take the meeting. Do a webinar that is so good, you're confident it would add value to every marketer on planet Earth and do that. And then you can figure out all the segmentation and the differentiation and how to compete with, with Zapier through a tear sheet and like, uh, or, you know, there's <laughs> exceptions. I think the best growth teams are really good at this stuff really early, right? There's, but, but, that, but let the people figure it out. I think I'm fine if founders know nothing about product marketing ever. <laughs> that is the best I think a lot of minute that's ever been said on this podcast. I just a, like a to go on record. From, a lot of founders come from they product do. backgrounds and I think they, they like, like the it. idea of product and marketing. They they love the, uh, you know, I'll, I'll have an incredible story for the thing that I've created and yeah, that no one the world, but, I, but, but no one will read it because no one's coming to your website. No one's reading your emails. No one's clicking on all the things. If you're you first on. head of mark, first head of marketing, and you guys can challenge me on this because you have a lot of experience. I, but I would say 98.74% of the time, if your first head of marketing was a product marketer, a corporate marketer, a head of communications, 
a head of brand, oh. marketing, <laughs> anything that does not me. say in the title, e- either the title or or here's the cheat code, the first one or two lines that are LinkedIn. If it doesn't say demand gen or growth or something, they could their title could be whatever on the it could be VP of marketing or CMO. But if do, if their first thing they're not proud of is getting you customers quantitatively, that cannot be your first hire. Never, never. And you're right. You're right, Kieran. So many founders, like they don't know what marketing is and they fall in love with this product marketer they meet. And I can't, and so many, and, or, and some of the others fall in love with someone with a communications background. Like, like I love, I love Linda. She, you know, she worked at HubSpot <laughs> in their communications department talking to Wall Street. I'm sure she was great at HubSpot, but we don't have a strong need to talk to Wall Street at, at the moment, right? <laughs> the, the, the communications people are often very polished in a diff, in an external way in the way the product people can talk with engineers, right? And I see it just like, Listen, yes. hire, hire Linda the year before you go public. Like, keep her in the Rolodex. Like, the HubSpot's a great place. You know, I would definitely hire anyone from their comms team <laughs> at the growth stage. <laughs> but, but those right. titles, but you, that's those, not those, your those, first those, hire. They can't get you cut. The bottom line is anyone with those titles can't get you prospects, can't get you leads, can't get you opportunities, can't get you customers. They can get you other stuff. All your, your marketer's job is it, going back to Kip's point, you know, zero to one, you don't need to worry about marketing, right? As you approach 10, it starts to become important. You know, as you approach a billion, it's the entire game, but you don't need anybody with those skills from like zero to three or four million in revenue. You just don't need it. You don't need none of those skills. Uh, the savage thing I will say to close us out is if the product was actually yeah. that good and that differentiated, you actually wouldn't need comms or product marketing. Yes. You don't, you don't need it because it is going to generate enough interest in word of mouth and be simple Pretty enough sure to OpenAI understand. doesn't have a single product marketer and they have a hundred million users because they have incredible product market fit and the product is like simplistic and, and talks. I know that's a like sweeping yes. generalization, but there is a reason like distribution is undefeated because it's the hardest thing to do. And in this, in this market, especially in SaaS today, when you have like a hundred products that look very similar in every single cat- category, audience growth distribution is the hardest thing skill to learn and the most important skill to have. Yeah, it is. Listen, it's not that the concept isn't important. It's just not going to put points on the board, right? It's not, it's not going to these issues. Yes. I've got customers small to even large, right? If, if you're sort of PLG plus SLG, if people can use you, you know, HubSpot's largest customers need a different set of messages than its smallest ones, right? The ones that just buy CRM need a different set of messages than buy the whole suite. There's, and that's complicated, right? I've got now at HubSpot, I've got like five yeah, core products, is. right? Um, maybe it's more, but it's like five biggies, right? I've got, three segments of customers. That's already 15 different messages. I've got half my customers outside of the United States. They might need slightly different message. Now I'm up 30. I could come up with another vector, right? So it's like, you know, I'd love to have 60 or 70 different, but, uh, but does it put points on the board? Like that's, I want leads. It doesn't create top of the problem is none of that creates top of funnel. And you know what solves revenue problems? Top of the funnel. I've never had a time where if you haven't jammed up that top of the funnel that hasn't fixed all revenue problems and that's that's the that is the number one premier skill if you're out there and you're doing marketing you're trying to build your career you're a founder hiring a marketer that acquisition distribution top of the funnel demand generation yeah. is, is i will everything. add one last thing to kieran said something that i think is fundamental Please. today these days M- maybe more for founders and marketers but for anyone anyone that's a stakeholder it, it, especially to startup is folks are saying there's a downturn today. You hear this all the time. It's not a downturn. It's just a side turn. HubSpot has, you know, HubSpot's public. Like we see some macro headwinds, like like people are managing budgets, but they're still doing pretty good at 2.4 billion in revenue and new customer acquisition, 23%. What I mean by that is, it's not that there aren't challenges in the world, right? Um, it's uh, even for HubSpot, it's harder than 2021, right? But the, que- the question founders aren't, are still not being honest about today is, do you have the product market fit you used to have in today's world? The world has changed for a lot of reasons Mm -hmm. and too many folks are blaming saying there's a downturn or macro headwinds. HubSpot added 23% new customers at, it has two, it has 200,000 customers scoring new customers, 23%. What HubSpot may have a bunch of challenges, but people want to, it has a lot of product market fit. Like, and so too many founders are, got an excuse in 2022, 2023 because the markets were down, right? Just get lean, get profitable, right? Don't spend too much money, but if you didn't innovate the last two years, and this ties to the beginning of the conversation around AI, if you're not, if you're not innovating, um, maybe HubSpot, you know, maybe three years ago, the Hub, HubSpot CRM, maybe you weren't sure. Today, like every startup I talk to, 40, 50, 60, 80 million in revenue using HubSpot CRM, they're not, they're not switching. 
HubSpot CRM no. is so much better than it was two years ago that you, if you competing, I'm just picking an example. If you're competing there, you sure better be much better than you were a couple of years ago. Much, right. much better, right? So, yeah, you have to be much better on the product side and much yeah. better on the distribution. So be side, honest right? against any incumbent in any category. In be any honest. category, do, do you? If you if you're having challenging times, ha, go go into Karen's point. Does the market still need your product as much? If not, give yourself a kick in the rear and go build it. You, go yeah. build it because too many founders are hiding in decaying product market fit today. In decaying product market fit, too many. Ooh, yeah, I like that. All right, that, I think that's the perfect that's the perfect note to end on. I got my soundbite okay. on product marketing, which made <laughs> which made me happy. We got to talk AI. It was all amazing. Jason, thank you so much right, for coming on. Really, really appreciate it for me. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, Jason. This data is wrong every freaking time. Have you heard of HubSpot? HubSpot is a CRM platform where everything is fully integrated. Whoa, I can see the client's whole history: calls, support tickets, emails, and. Here's a task from three days ago I totally missed. HubSpot, grow better. 